Well, let's start off with a few announcements. I know Tom King fell in last night and is bruised up, so he won't there at home. And staying there this evening, he's uh, evidently black and blue around the eyes. Also, Carla Roper's uh, mom, uh, Doug and Janiel's daughter-in-law. But anyhow, the mom, Annabeth Covey, is having a heart catheterization cath tomorrow morning, so they're requesting prayers uh, for her, and that'd be Annabeth Covey. Are there any other folks that we need to make any announcements about? Yes, sir, go ahead. Your uncle's name? Bill Phillips. In the Colleen area at some point. <laughs> yeah. And is recovering. So the tubes are out. Okay. Let's keep each of these in mind. Let's keep each of these in our minds as we pray. Let's start with a prayer tonight. Father, you are Lord. God Almighty, and we approach you in thanks, knowing that there is just no way to comprehend you, but knowing that you comprehend us. You love us. You sent your Son to save us. You guide us. We ask you to strengthen those that are weak, the ones who we've already mentioned, and Father, some that haven't been brought up tonight. We also ask that you help strengthen each of our resolves to help each other and to help others in finding you. Guide us how to do so in studying your word tonight and singing together in worship. Again, Father, thank you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, good evening, everyone. West Freeway Church of Christ, Wednesday night worship service. So you guys missed a good lesson on Monday night, Chris Swinford brought a great lesson, uh, evangelophobia. Uh, it's probably not a word you're going to find in a dictionary or Wikipedia, but uh, what it means is uh, the fear of evangelism. And um, what we're trying to do as Christians is overcome that fear so that we can share the good news um, the good news that came through the prophets, the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Micah. The prophets brought the good news of Jesus that was coming into the world. Um, this time of year, everyone's talking about Jesus. Of course, we talk about Jesus every day. But uh, I'm glad that uh, everyone you see right now if you ask them about Jesus, they're going to they're gonna acknowledge him and his name. Therefore, it's, it's just easy to talk to people about this right now. And, and that's what we want to do, is talk about the salvation. And so the prophets brought the words. And it brought to, it brought to, it brought to mind uh, DJ's class on... Uh, ancient history and the Isaiah scrolls that were found in 1940 and it brought to mind this song let's sing holy words long preserved for our walk in this 
this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope. Give us strength, help us go in this world where'er we roam. Ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart holy words of our faith handed down to this age came to us through sacrifice oh heed the faithful words of christ holy for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Amen. Well, it's time for our classes. So we are going to continue our look into 1 Peter tonight, and we are moving along here into chapter 2. So if you will, have your Bibles, go ahead and open to 1 Peter chapter 2 this evening. All right, so last week we looked at the end there of, uh, of chapter 1, and we looked at the Christian life and attitude and conduct that, uh, that is expected, and really we look at the end there in, uh, in verse, where are we? Uh, verse 16, all right? You also be holy in all your conduct, because it is, as it is written, be holy, for I am holy. And we've noted several times throughout the book that our conduct and the foundation for our life begins with a recognition of what God has done for us. And that theme is going to continue into uh, chapter 2 um, as we look at these things that, that Peter has to say to us about our place um, in the household of God. Right? And so in chapter 2, he begins with the words, Therefore... It says, therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Right, now, therefore, it, this is kind of an unfortunate chapter division right here at the beginning of chapter 2, because really, uh, this verse, these three verses, tie up the discussion that he began all the way back in uh, verse 13, where he says, Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully on the grace that is in Christ. Right? So, in the previous context, Peter talked about how we are to set our hope fully on the salvation that we have through grace in Jesus Christ. And we do that by preparing our minds for action, bringing our thoughts under subjection. And because we have been saved, 
We commit ourselves to living holy lives that reflect the character of our Heavenly Father who redeemed us with the priceless blood of Jesus Christ. And then the latter half of chapter 1 talks about how God revealed this message through his unchanging and perfect holy word. And that God's word is the seed that brings life to us, that allows us to be born again into a Christian family. And that Christian family is characterized by a sincere love for each other. Uh, verse 22 of chapter 1 says, You've been, You have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren. Love one another fervently with a pure heart. Right? So he ends chapter 1 by emphasizing this new family that we are a part of. And because we are a new family, we are a new creation uh, that should create within us new behaviors and new desires. Right? And so when Peter says, Therefore... He's looking back to what he had just said that reminded us, hey, we are a family. We, we are this new creation, this new family, new group together in Jesus Christ. And he says, okay, because you are this new family, it's time for you to lay aside all of the things that might get in the way of you loving your brethren. And really, that is, that's what he's talking about here. The verb... Lay aside, right, when he talks about laying aside all of these things, is the idea of, of taking something off, right? Where you, you have something, well, you're going to remove it, you're going to set it to the side, it's not going to, to weigh you down or be in your way anymore, right? Now, there's language elsewhere in the New Testament that talks about the idea in the opposite way of putting on Jesus Christ, right? You have Romans chapter 13 and verse 4 says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. And then again in Galatians 3 uh, and verse 27, says, as many of you as were baptized into Christ Jesus have put on Christ. Right now, if we are going to put on Christ, we also need to take off our dirty clothes. Right? Most people... You know, unless you're a nine-year-old going to camp for the first time, you don't just put clean underwear over the underwear you wore the day before, right? I've heard stories of a dear friend of mine, how his son came home wearing nine pairs of underwear because he, he didn't change it. We're just going to put it on over the ones we've already gotten. We're, we're going to call it good because he could say, I put on clean underwear every day, right? But if you don't take off what's already dirty, putting on what's clean doesn't really do you a whole lot of good. Right? Now, this process of, of removing sin, laying these things aside, and putting on Christ, it starts at baptism. Right? That, that is the place where our sins are washed away. We, we are made new. We are, we are brought into this new family. Right? But the process of laying aside sin, that's something that happens every day. Right? It is a daily process because nobody here is perfect after baptism, and nobody will be perfect after being baptized. And so we have to continually be aware of all of these things, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, evil speaking. We have to be aware of these things that could get in the way of us fulfilling that function of loving one another. Right? Every single thing that Peter mentions here kind of tears at the fabric of the church, tears apart those threads of love that should bind us together. And so we need to define each of these things so that we know how to Avoid them. And we'll, we'll do that very briefly. The idea of malice is simply having bad will towards someone else. Right? It's the idea of, you know, somebody cuts you off in traffic and you're like, I hope they blow out a tire. I, I, please tell me I'm not the only one that's ever thought that, right? Or at the very least, I, I hope there's a cop right around that corner so they get pulled over, right? You know, the, this idea that, oh, somebody has done something and I'm going to wish bad will towards them, right? Well, we can't desire bad things to happen to our brethren and also love them at the same time, right? Those, those two ideas are incompatible, right? So putting away malice, putting away deceit, the Greek word of, uh, the Greek root of this word is actually used to describe bait for fish, right? So the idea of, of bait, right? If you're wiggling a worm down there in the water, it's not really a free meal for that fish, is it? You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a trap, 
Right, well, that's the idea here of deceit. Anything that is used for, for trickery, for you're, you're presenting one thing, but the reality is something very different. Right? And the problem with deceit is that it erodes trust. And any fruitful relationship has to be founded on trust. Right? You have to be able to have the faith that that other person is going to do what they say. Right? And it's really hard to have a mutually loving relationship if you never know if the other person is genuine. Right? And so if, if we give in to deceit and we try to manipulate one another to get what we want, you're never going to have a good relationship that grows out of that. Right? You may get what you want in the short term, but in the long term, you're, you're harming your ability to grow up into uh, the family of God. Right? And then the word hypocrisy uh, actually has its roots in theater. Right? Um, the idea of a hypocrite is somebody who is putting on an act. Right? They, they say things and they do things, and on the outside they're very different than who they actually are. Right? And of course that perfectly describes an actor. Right? They get into character and they act and do things very differently than the person they, they are everywhere else outside of that stage, right? Well, we don't need to uh, put on an act. Because again, this is something that erodes trust. This is something that if, if I can't act genuine and I am a hypocrite, I'm not going to be able to develop those bonds of love, right? It's going to tear them apart. Um, and then envy is when we are longing for something that somebody else has. We're always looking to the blessings of another person, and the problem is that causes us to disregard our own blessings, right? We, we are not content with what we have, and so we look at what everyone else has, and then the problem is a lot of times if we see somebody who has something that we don't, we start to dislike them just on the basis of they have a thing that I want and I don't have it, right? Um, that, of course, is going to get in the way of love. And the cure for envy really is just looking at your own blessings, right? If you're ever envious, stop and think and count your blessings, name them one by one, right? It's, it's really hard to be jealous of somebody else when you stop and take inventory of all the things God has already given you, and you realize how selfish it is to be jealous of someone else, right? Also, there's, there's a pretty good chance that you may have something that they would desperately desire. Right? And so this idea of envy and jealousy and ill will towards other people simply because we have been blessed with different things is not compatible uh, with a family that loves one another. And then the last one here, evil speaking, um, it's the idea of slander, right? saying bad things about your brethren and talking down about them. You know, we've all heard the saying, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Right? And that... that one phrase, those words of wisdom, they apply your entire life. Because here's the thing, is if we can poison our minds against our brethren if we verbalize bad things about them, right? When we, when we say negative things about our brethren, it can cause us to continue thinking negative things, and it creates a barrier to a close relationship. Right? This is why even, even psychologists and counselors will talk about the power of self-talk. Right? That when you talk and say positive things about yourself and you affirm your own value and your own worth verbally to yourself, it actually does help your attitude. Right? Versus the other way, if you are to yourself constantly putting yourself down, you have negative self-talk and you are expressing those things verbally, it can cause you to have a diminished view of yourself, and, and it, you become ineffective and hard to do things. Well, it's, it's very much the same when we're looking at other people, right? We, instead of expressing evil things and negative things towards our brethren, positive things, right? Only look at the positive. Again, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. And if you don't have something nice to say, try to find something nice to say, right? That, that's even better. Now, and these attitudes that Peter lists here, these are all things that most people, and yes, that, that includes Christians, 
that most people are going to default to if we are not intentional about doing something different, right? It's very easy to fall into malice and deceit and evil speaking and negativity, right? I mean, just look at the the 24-hour news cycle that we have now. The thing that gets the most clicks and the most watches is always going to be something that's negative, right? It's rage bait. It's, It's something that's trying to get you outraged and upset because that's what gets people to interact. That's our default setting. We have to work hard and be intentional about doing something different, right? So we have to actively lay these things aside and put them away from us so that we, we remove these barriers to love, right? And so this new loving family that we're a part of, to, to live in this family effectively, we need to set aside all of these negative things, right? Right? But then the key admonition in this verse is found in in verse 2, where he says, desire the pure milk of the word. And he says, and then he he adds to it, right, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word. The idea being spiritual nourishment. We lay aside these bad habits, which is good, but then we also need to fill our lives with something else. Right? You can't just put away the negative habits because eventually you can just replace them with other negative habits. You have to replace them with something good. And so he says, put these things away, but also desire the pure milk of the word like a newborn babe. Right? How, how do you know when a baby is hungry? It cries. And how do you get that baby to stop crying? Yeah. What happens if you just give it a pacifier? Yeah, it, it might last for, uh, for a few minutes, and then they're going to go right back to crying. And eventually they're going to get so hungry where they're going to take that pacifier and, and they're going to spit it on the ground. They're going to let you know they are hungry. They need food. And the only thing that is going to solve that problem is milk. It, it is giving them that nourishment that they desire. Right? And so, yeah, and there's no substitute for it, right? When you, when you are hungry, there is no substitute for food, right? Yeah, even a piece of gum, you chew a piece of gum for a little while just to give your mouth something to do, and eventually it's just going to make you more hungry, right? There is no substitute for that nourishment. And so what Peter is saying is you need to desire spiritual growth and to desire God's word the way that an infant desires milk when it's hungry. Meaning that it is something that we should want, something that we should recognize as not just beneficial, but something that is essential for us if we are to grow, right? All spiritual growth, just like all growth in general, is built on having a healthy diet. So if we are going to grow spiritually... We need to have a healthy diet of spiritual food, right? We can't just hear a few things and then go about our life thinking that, well, I've gotten enough nourishment and now I can just go out and do, you know, I'll just go and do good things and that's going to be enough, right? Um, Athletes, right? If they are trying to, maybe in the off season, they're trying to build muscle, right? They're trying to get stronger for for that next season of football or basketball or whatever it is. They can do all of the workouts in the world. They can spend hours and hours in the gym. But if they don't eat properly, if they don't eat enough, they're not going to see any results. In fact, what's more likely to happen is if you have an athlete training really hard and they're under eating, they're just going to get hurt. And they're going to end up going backwards. Right? So even if we are doing good things, that's necessary. Right? But we also need to make sure that we are constantly getting spiritual nourishment, right? Because when we are active in the church, that's a great thing. But our activity is only going to be enhanced when we also have this continual diet of God's Word, right? The activity helps us to understand the Word better, which enhances our activity, which helps us understand the Word better, and you get this great positive feedback loop. Right? You have to have both things in place. Um, because he says here, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. 
See, the, the intended and expected result of a good diet is spiritual growth. And that spiritual milk is the very substance of life. If we aren't growing, right, we're either not doing the right things or we are not consuming the right things. Right? I see in Hebrews chapter 5, 12 through 14, the Hebrews writer uses a, a similar idea, which again emphasizes that we are expected to grow. Okay? Hebrews 12 and verse 14, or he, he, excuse me, Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. It says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God and have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Right? So we need to have that spiritual milk, right? And here, just the idea of spiritual nourishment, constantly getting the things that we need to grow, which is going to come from God's word. Okay? But we also have to make sure that we are doing the right things. When you have both of them together, growth will be the result. Right? You, you can't make a determination to be active in the Lord's church and to study your Bible on a regular basis and to be involved in spiritual discussions with your brethren and not grow. Right? It, it will not, there, there is not a situation where you are going to do those things and you are going to be a worse Christian than you were before you started. Right? It's not going to happen. When those things are there, a right spiritual diet with the right activity, there will be growth. And then again, he ends this with the phrase, if you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Again, as Christians, we do everything in light of what God has done for us. Right? So if we really have recognized the grace of God, then why wouldn't we want his word? Why wouldn't we desire to consume that spiritual nourishment that God has made available? Right? Everything we do is all part of, of who God is. Right? So living life as part of this new spiritual family begins with desiring the word of God. Set aside all those things that would get in the way of love and make a commitment to consuming God's word on a regular basis. Now, questions or comments before we move on to the next section? Yes, sir. Who mm -hmm. Right. Right, and, and, and commentaries and books have their place, but reading an article about God's Word and just getting your nose into the book and thinking for yourself and wrestling with it on your own, those are very different things, right? So, yeah, desire the pure, unadulterated milk of the Word, right? Get in there, you know, use, like I said, use a reliable translation, um, and if you have questions about that, you know, feel free to come and, and talk to me, but... Um, yeah, that milk that we desire, the, what God has given us is pure. Right? We just need to make sure that we are getting what is pure, and that is going to help us to grow. All right, next section is we need to recognize our important place in God's kingdom. It says here, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Right? So he starts off by referencing Jesus to being a living stone. Right? In what way was Jesus a living stone? Right? What made him living? I, 
and yeah, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not a dumb question. It's just very simple, right? Because he is alive, right? Normally, when we think of a stone, a stone is it's dead. There, there's no life in it. It's not animated. But Jesus, as the foundation of the spiritual house that he's talking about, and, and he, he'll get into this idea of Jesus being the foundation in the next few verses, but Jesus is not dead. Uh, he is a living stone. And I think here, Peter is just trying to reference again to his resurrection, right? That he, uh, you go all the way back to verse 3, it says that he's begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, right? So he's returning to this theme of Jesus being the one that is alive and that brings life to us as Christians, right? We can look forward to eternal life because Jesus still lives, Right? So he is emphasizing that within this new family and within God's spiritual house, that is where life is found. Right? It begins with Jesus as a living stone. And then, he, as he gets to later, right, we also get to be described um, as living stones. Right? But then, then he emphasizes here that Jesus was injected redeemed, indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. Right? Now, you have to consider that in this region, right, that he is um, writing to these pilgrims of the dispersion, people who were all throughout the Roman Empire, they believed in a God who was crucified as a criminal. There was going to be some pushback from their peers about this, about this Jesus that they believed in. And so Peter is recognizing, yes, he was rejected by men. Men did kill him and put him on the cross, but he was chosen by God. And that's what's important. Right? Don't focus on the rejected indeed by men. He says, but he was chosen by God and precious. And this is the same argument Peter uses other places in Scripture that Jesus was, in fact, chosen by God even though man rejected him. Right? In Acts chapter 4, verses 8 through 12, in this context, Peter and John had just healed a lame man on the temple grounds. And as a, as a crowd gathered around because they witnessed this miracle, they preached the gospel to them. While the Sadducees didn't like that message of the resurrection, they threw Peter and John in prison. And the next day, all of the Jewish leaders and rulers came together to question them. And in Acts 4, verse 8, it says, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel... If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all people of Israel but that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is now salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. See, the leaders may have rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah, right? That he was not the Savior and the leader that they were expecting, nor the leader that they wanted. But that didn't change the reality that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And even though they rejected him and they had him crucified... This cornerstone that they rejected, God is still using that as his foundation, right? Because he is a living stone. Death could not stop him, right? And so even though Jesus was destroyed, he was, his body was killed, and yet he still gets to be this living stone, verse 5 says, You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house. Now, again, going back to this idea in chapter 1 and verse 3, that we have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right? We have the expectation of eternal life because Jesus was raised from the dead first. Right? Think in the first class we referenced 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20, about how Jesus was the first fruits of those that slept, right? or the, the, the first fruits of, of the dead. Right? Because Jesus was resurrected and was given a new body and a new life, well, we have the expectation that the same will happen to us because Jesus was man just as much as he was God. And so if a man could be resurrected and given this new body and given this life and this home in heaven, 
we have the hope of the same thing through Jesus. Right? And so he says, you also as living stones, we get to have that same quality of life that Jesus had. Right? The same quality of life Jesus was given, we have access to through him. Okay? And then he talks about being built up a spiritual house. Right? What's, what is a house used for? Refuge, shelter, right? You live in it, don't you? Yeah, it's the place where you get to sleep, where you get to dwell. The things that are important to you are there with you in your house. It, it, it's your home, right? And so when he talks about us as living stones, Christians are being built up a spiritual house, he's talking about Christians being the place where God dwells on earth right god lives within the church and this is a concept that is 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 presented in other places in scripture for example in first corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16 paul says do you not know that you are the temple of god and that the spirit of god dwells in you and then in ephesians chapter 2 19 through 22 it says, therefore, you are no longer strangers or foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, and whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple to the Lord, and whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Right? The picture that Peter is painting here is of the church, this, this group of believers who have faith in Jesus Christ, that we are, as a group, the household of God. We are the place where God dwells. But also, each of us are individuals. We make up the stones, right? You, you can't have a brick house without laying down some bricks, Right? So together we make up this household of God, but individually each one of us make up a brick in that household. And each one of those bricks is important. Right? So we are being built up as living stones into this spiritual house. And then he says that we are a holy priesthood. Right? We look at the priesthood in the Old Testament. Right? Who, who was allowed to serve in the priesthood? Right, just the Levites, right? And the priests in the Old Testament, they, they had special access to God that other people didn't have, right? You had the priests that could go into the holy place where nobody else was allowed to go, and only the high priest was allowed to go into the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was and where they believed that the presence of God was, right? So he's talking about us now as a holy priesthood we get to have this special access to God that we didn't have before, right? So as part of this new family and being built up in God's house, there's no restricted access to God anymore, right? We are part of that holy priesthood, right? But also, what, what was the function of a priest? What are some of the things they did? They offered sacrifices. Yes, they offered sacrifices, that, that was one of their, their primary things. And again, he talks about that here, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Um, Leviticus chapter 1 describes this process of how a sacrifice was given. Right, uh, The animal would be selected and brought to the priest. The priest would lay his hands on that animal, and the priest would kill it and burn that animal before the altar. And so there was this sense where a priest act as a mediator between man and God. And for people to access God, they had to go through the priesthood, right? Well, we act as that priesthood now. If people are going to know Jesus and have a relationship with God, how are they come, going to come to know Jesus Christ? We're going to have to show them. Right? We, are, we have to tell them the story of Jesus and show them Jesus Christ. We, we are now acting as that mediator. Right? So if people are going to come to God, well, we need to be the ones that, that bring them. 
Right? We are that priesthood that we offer up these spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God, he says at the end here, through Jesus Christ. Right? No longer through the law. Yeah, get rid of the evangelophobia. Right? Yeah, and so like, like Leslie, Leslie points out, when Jesus Christ died and was resurrected, the veil of the temple was torn, indicating that this access that used to be restricted to God, wasn't there anymore. Right? There, there was no longer any barrier between man and God because Jesus Christ tore those barriers down. Right? And so now when we offer up spiritual sacrifices, we don't do it through the law of Moses. We don't do it through the will of a man. We do it through Jesus Christ because he's the one that opened up that door. But that also means that Jesus is the one that dictates how we come to God. Right? We can't offer up sacrifices any other way other than the way Jesus Christ tells us to. And Peter is going to back up his claim here with Scripture. We go here in verses, uh, verse 6. It says, Therefore it is also contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Now this text here is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 16. And in the context of Isaiah chapter 28, um, it's a message about judgment on Ephraim for their disobedience and unbelief. Uh, and really the main theme of that section of Isaiah, and really the whole book of Isaiah, is that those who trust in God will escape judgment. And Isaiah continually encourage the people not to put their trust in foreign alliances or in military strength, but to trust in God only. And he says, those who trust in God will by no means be put to shame. Right? And this idea of shame is going to be important later on as, as Peter starts to address the persecution and challenges that came with belief in Christ, especially in the first century. Right? Even today, the world wants us to be ashamed of Christ. Wants us to feel like we are less than because we believe in God and we worship Jesus and we, and we try to live this holy life because of who Christ was. But no matter what people might say about us on earth, we will be vindicated in the resurrection. Right? There's going to be no shame for us at the end. Because we're going to see that everything that we believed was true and that God is going to exalt us even, even if men put us down. Okay? And then we get to verses 7 and 8. And here I, I'm using the ESV translation because I think it, it fits better the overall context, um, how they choose to translate this first part. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll go over what other translations say as well. It says, so the honor is for you who believe but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Now I want to start with this, this first phrase, the honor is for you who believe. Uh, I believe it's the NIV, New King James, and New American Standard translates this, to you who believe he is precious. And now that is a true statement. Right? A relationship with Jesus is priceless. Right? He should be precious and valuable to us above and beyond any other relationship that we have. Right? However, Peter is making a contrast with verse 6. Right? And remember the quotation in verse 6 is talking about this idea of being put to shame. Right? Well, what's the opposite of shame? Honor. Honor. Right? The opposite of being ashamed is being honored, right? Be, being lifted up. And so I think this translation of that phrase fits better uh, with the overall context, right? Instead of being ashamed because of our trust and belief in God, we are going to be honored and exalted and lifted up. I, the honor is going to be on us who believe. There will be no shame, only honor bestowed upon us from God. The shame is going to come upon those who do not believe and whom this living cornerstone becomes a stumbling block. Now, this, is, this uh, here, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstones from Psalm 118, 
in verse 12. And in that context, at least in the immediate context of that prophecy, who are the chief builders that are being referenced? Say it louder. Yeah, Pharisees and Sadducees, the the religious leaders who should have been looking out for the overall well-being of Israel. When Jesus came to them, again, because he didn't form to their preconceived idea of who the Messiah was going to be, they rejected him and cast him out. Right? It, It was the religious leaders of Israel who had Jesus crucified. They thought they were building on God's house. But they rejected the cornerstone that God himself had appointed. Then he says that it would be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. This is a quote from Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 14. And in this context in Isaiah chapter 8, God is telling Israel that they were going to be taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And that God, who was their salvation, was also going to be their doom because they did not obey him and they did not honor him. Right? The kingdom of, of Israel, the northern kingdom at this time, was full of idolatry. Right? People had, had left God behind. He became just one amongst many gods that they may have reverenced. And in Isaiah 8, 13, it says, The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow, let him be your fear and let him be your dread. He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel and a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble, and they shall fall, and be broken, be snared, and taken. Right? And the reason that they stumble, the reason they stumbled in the time of Isaiah is because they didn't obey. Right? They broke that commandment to have no other gods before Yahweh. Right? They broke that commandment, and then so God was going to fall on them in judgment. Right? But the reason they stumbled and disobeyed, or the reason they stumbled is because of their disobedience now here it says they disobey the word as they were destined to do i want to address that that phrase real quickly because that doesn't imply that they disobeyed god because god determined that they were going to disobey them okay we have free will and god is not going to take that away from us right their disobedience was fully within their own will and desires to do, okay? Think about Jesus, right? He was destined to be crucified on the cross, and yet in Acts chapter 2, Peter still held people accountable for Christ's crucifixion. He didn't say, oh, well, it's okay because Jesus was destined to be crucified and it had to happen sometimes, so so y'all are free of any responsibility. That's not what he said. God knew what was going to happen. God didn't predetermine that these things were going to happen. He foreknew, but he didn't didn't get into people's will and change their will, even though he knew what they were going to do. Correct. Yeah, and Ed's got it right. It's not that they were destined to disobey. They were destined to stumble because of their disobedience. Right? They had the choice on whether or not they were going to obey. It's not as if God has predetermined some individuals are going to obey him and honor him and that some individuals are going to disobey him. Rather, God has predetermined that certain types of people will obey and some will disobey. Those who honor Christ are going to be the ones that obey him and follow him. Those who reject Christ, they, they don't have any option left, right? If we reject Jesus Christ, disobedience is the only option, right? Because if we reject Jesus, there's no one else coming for us to obey. I, I, I have down here Hebrews 10, 26, and 27 because I think it kind of captures this idea says, if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. There is no other way to God 
except through Jesus Christ. Right? There is no other sacrifice for, that will cover our sins because Jesus Christ was already sacrificed. Right? And so for these people, because they rejected the chief cornerstone, well, they rejected their place in the household of God. Right? Because Jesus was the foundation, there was no way for them to get in because they disobeyed God and rejected the Messiah, rejected that chief cornerstone that, that he placed. Right? And so it wasn't that, again, they were destined to disobey. But because they rejected Christ, well, that was their only option. And then in Acts chapter 10, 34 and 35, says, Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. All right? We all have the choice to whether or not we are going to obey God. However, we can't get around the consequences. If we choose to disobey well, there's no other option for us to be saved. The only option is repentance and baptism and going through Jesus Christ to restore that relationship with God. And then we'll finish quickly here in verses 9 through 10. It says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. All right, so while those who reject Christ are destined for destruction, those who believe in Christ are God's chosen nation. And I believe here Peter is alluding to Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 through 6. Right, This idea of a chosen generation, a priesthood, a holy nation, his special people. Well, if we look at Exodus 19... See how some of these things are very similar. It says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. The point that Peter is making here, and the reason he makes this allusion to Exodus 19, is that all the expectations and blessings that belonged to the Old Testament Israel now belong to the church. Right? We are God's special people, and we have been given a special mission and a special purpose. Right? And if we look in verse 9, what is that special purpose? Right? Why, why have we been chosen as this special people and this royal priesthood? What's our purpose? Yeah, to proclaim the praises of him, to share the good news, right? Remember how we said the function of a priest was a mediator between God and men, right? Again, the only way people are going to see Jesus Christ in 2023 is through us. We have to proclaim who God is, and we have to proclaim what he's done for us, right? The, to proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into light. Right? We have to show people that following God, that that's a better way. Right? We have to show people that they are in darkness, but that God can bring us out of it. And he reminds them again, we once were not a people, but are now the people of God. Right? He is reminding these Christians where they were or where they had been so that they could better appreciate where they are now. Right? Our mission is to share our transformation with others and to help others see the light. Yes, sir. Back to uh, the priesthood thing, when we were talking about earlier the spiritual sacrifice, on so much bread that they bread, what does that look like, spiritual sacrifice? So one of the, one of the big things that caused the very big effect was some of the excellent priests who knew the hand of the Lord, but not having been to the holy yet. So I think that's a big part of what these spiritual sacrifices are. I'd say by and large, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and well, and the idea of a living sacrifice is something that's alive. There's activity that goes along with that, right? Mm -hmm. That's right, right. And, you know, we do have to look in the mirror and make sure that am I, you know, I, you are a priest in the kingdom of God, right? That, that, that's what Peter is saying. You are a priest in the kingdom of God and you have a special function. Are you doing your job, right? And again, the reason that it's spiritual sacrifices, like, you know, it, it, it could be easy to open our wallet and give money, just like, you know, Yes, there was a investment that went along with sacrificing an animal, but you know, that doesn't really require anything of you other than sacrificing that animal. Spiritual sacrifices require, like Joe brought up, a sacrifice of our time, a sacrifice of our comfort. Right? It, it's, it's a complete change in our priorities. Right? And really, the idea of a spiritual sacrifice is we are sacrificing our will to God's will. Which means there's sometimes where there's things that I want to do, but I also have the opportunity to do something for the Lord. I need to be I need to choose what's what's going to be good for the Lord and for his people rather than what's going to make me comfortable. Right? And so when we talk about the idea of a sacrifice, one of the primary things is that a sacrifice has to cost us something, doesn't it? Right? So when we offer those spiritual sacrifices, we have to think, well, what what am I doing and what am I giving to be that priest in God's kingdom? Appreciate that. All right, we are done for the night. We will uh, pick up in chapter 2 next week. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, our Lord and our God, we are so thankful for the opportunity that we've had to be here and to look into your word. And Father, pray that we might uh, be more motivated uh, to serve you as we recognize our, our important place in your kingdom, that Lord, you would help us to fulfill our mission as priests, to go out into the world and to reach the lost and to offer those spiritual sacrifices and to show people that you have brought us into light. Lord, pray that as we leave here, that you would watch over us and keep us safe and that if it's your will, we would be able to come together again. And Lord, pray that all of us might, might walk in light and truly proclaim your love to those uh, that we see each day. Be with us, forgive us of our sin, in Jesus' name, amen.